There it is. Okay, so this is assignment 4.2. It's called the federal courts. And um, if you started it, you probably watched this video, which talks about a lot of the things about the federal court system and how it works, how it's put together. And in the assignment itself, I give you a link to a website. I think this, yeah, this is the one out of the, out of, um, uh, the, Fed, the just Washington, D.C. I used to want to use one from Missouri, but it was really confusing because they talked about Missouri courts. And anyway, this, this is the new one. This is a good one. So if you watch the video and you worked with this website, you should have, I'd say, about two thirds to three quarters of these white columns done. And I'm going to fill in the rest of them for you. I'm going to, we're going to talk about all of them. Um, and I asked you not to worry about the pink one because we do that together. And by doing so, I think we'll start to see how these different levels of the courts fit together um, in the court system. So on whatever day it was, uh, Monday maybe, we went through, oh, we went through this one, all checks and balances. And then we got to this slide. And so I, I said, uh, the federal court system has, you know, three different tiers to it, right? Uh, it has uh, it has the Supreme Court, which is the one that most people know about. Uh, it has what's called the Court of Appeals, also called the Circuit Courts, and it has the U.S. District Courts. And what we're going to do is look up, look at how those three things fit together. And I, I always try to think about well, what is it? What is it like? What's a good analogy to it? And I don't know how many of you uh, pay attention to. Uh, professional sports or like like football. Um, I don't know if you are, are aware, uh, but this weekend is the beginning of the of the playoffs for um, the NFL, and um, and then the that usually ends with the Super Bowl, which most people know about. Well, if you think about a sport like the NFL or Major League Baseball or whatever sport you like to follow, even one at the high school level. Um, if you think about a season, there are really three different parts to that season. And I'm just going to use the NFL because it's happening now and a lot of people know about it. You have um, the beginning of the season, you, you have all your regular games. And, and whether it's a high school sport, maybe you play volleyball or something, you've got your regular games, right? And if you're really good and you make it to the playoffs, you've got that next section. You've got the, you've got the section of the playoffs. So uh, it's, it's step one, and then the playoffs is step two. And if you're really good, if you're really successful at the playoff level, you get to go to the championship. You get to go to the top level, the one game that really, that really decides who's in charge. And so as we talk about the federal court system and the three-tier system, it might help for you to think about it like a sporting season. You got your regular season lots of games lots of teams involved not all of them make it to the playoffs just the best and if they work their their uh their games right if they perform well if they're good enough they get to go to the championship game and at that point it's just one game right so if you think about the court system like that it might make a little bit more sense. And we're gonna see that the federal court system has a, a kind of a pattern to it. And that's where when you fill in this chart, when you're all done, you'll start to see that pattern. So we're gonna go through it here together. I just sort of walk you through it. Whoops, wrong, well, it's a work, I can get there. Click the wrong button, but there we go. That's what I want. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the federal court system and you should be able to fill in this chart using the information I'm gonna show you. So. The first question is, how many courts are there at each level? Now, um, there's these three boxes on the screen. I'm assuming you can see them. I hope I'm sharing this correctly. Looks like I am. Um, and there's this big green box, and there's this kind of medium-sized pink box, and then there's this little yellow box. Now, the sizes of these boxes matter, and I think you'll see the pattern come up. So. How many courts are there in the federal court system? Well, if you talk about the district court, there's 94 
Now, some sources say 91 because there's three that are kind of specialized. We're going to go ahead and say 94. And you can put that in the first white box under district courts. Now, if you go to the next level, remember like this is regular season. If you go to the playoffs, there's not as many, right? There's not as many teams involved. Some of them don't make the cut. And so uh, there's, oh, one more thing about the district and you might want to put this in there. There's at least one district court per state. Now there's 50 states, there's 94 district courts. Hmm, we'll, we'll see how that plays out here in just a minute. So the district courts, there are most, most number of courts are right there. Now, if you go to the, if you go to the circuit or the appeals court level, there's, they go by both names. Um, there are fewer, there's only 13. Now, um, I looked at a number of assignments that came in and a lot of you said there were 11. And a lot of times people uh, only count 11 because there's 11, but there's, there's two special ones and we'll, we'll see where they come out. So uh, you go from 94 to 13. So again, imagine this is a, a, a very big uh, sporting league where there's 94 teams and they play the regular season. And out of that 94 teams, um, you end up with 13 who make the playoffs. And um, after all that, after all the playoffs, there's only one left. There's only one game left. That's the Supreme Court. And so you can see you go from 94 to 13 to one. It narrows down as it moves forward, much, much like a sports season would with regular season playoffs and then the championship, right? And that's the basic design of the courts. And you're going to see those boxes on most of these slides. And you're going to see that most of the time, those boxes have the same pattern, big, medium, small. Now, if we go to uh, the next one, how many judges are there at each level? At the district level, there's 632 different judges. 632 across the country in those 94 district courts. In the appeals or circuit court, you can guess there's fewer, there's 179. And when we get to the final one, the Supreme Court, we know already how many? Nine. So again, big, medium, small. It narrows down as it goes through, okay? Next one, how many cases do they handle? Well, the district court, they handle about 300,000 cases each year. That's a lot. At the appeals or circuit court level, they handle about 40,000. So what is that? A little bit more than 10%, maybe 12%, maybe 13. And then at the Supreme Court, fewer still, only about 80 only about 80. So um, it goes from about 300,000 cases a year to, to 40,000 cases a year down to just 80. So again, it really narrows very quickly. And so the Supreme Court, the one we hear the most about, the most people know about, doesn't really hear a lot of cases during the year, only about 80 per year. But all of those 80 cases would have come from those 40,000. And those 40,000 would have come from those 300,000 because you make your way through just, just like that regular season, playoffs, championship. You don't get to the championship unless you've been through the playoffs. You don't get to the playoffs unless you've been through the regular season. So they go through, they work their way through. But in terms of number of cases, they're basically set up for that amount. Those are all estimate numbers. It varies from year to year. Sometimes the Supreme Court will hear 93. Some, some years they'll hear 78. Somewhere around 80 is pretty typical. Now, this word, jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, I think, is a term at the bottom of that assignment, if memory serves. Uh, but even if it's not, we want to know what that word means. Jurisdiction basically means where do they have the power to do things? So um, when we're in school at Columbia High School, and if I have a, um, a, a rule in my classroom that says no eating food, 
the jurisdiction where I can apply that rule is my classroom. But if I go out into C court and you're eating food, um, I can't really, you know, yell at you for eating food in my classroom because you're not in my classroom. It's outside my jurisdiction. And the word jurisdiction uses this, this word root, J-U-R-I-S, juris, it's the same word root as jury. You know, you have a jury in a trial and, and it has to do with the word law. So jurisdiction is where can you apply the law? So the district court <coughs> has a couple of different types of jurisdiction. It has a jurisdiction about where things happen. So if it happened within the district, that's part of its jurisdiction. And I'll explain that a little bit more on, on, I think, the next slide. And it also has a jurisdiction that's called original jurisdiction. Now, that means original. It means no one's done it yet. And so when there is a federal crime, federal criminal, or a federal civil case, which would be it's, there's not a crime involved, it's someone suing someone else, but it's at the federal level, then it would start its progress through the courts at the district court level. So let me give you an example. Uh, some people who went into the Capitol building yesterday in Washington, D.C. were arrested. Some were not arrested then, but they will be arrested and they'll face charges. And those will be federal charges because it happened in a federal building. So whatever the criminal charge is, is going to be held if they have a, if they have a trial, is going to be held at the district court level because the district court is the one that handles original cases for the first time. Now, if someone who went into the, uh, the Capitol building yesterday is arrested and put on trial and they're convicted of criminal trespass or vandalism or whatever it is, um, and they want to appeal it, they say, well, that wasn't fair. I didn't get a fair trial. They didn't let me make my arguments or they used evidence against me they shouldn't have been able to, then they can appeal it and they can appeal that at the next level of courts. They can appeal that to the appeals court of the circuit court. Now, again, that has a certain jurisdiction. If it's within the circuit, and again, I'll show you a map in a second, and I'll make a little bit more sense. So it has a location or a geographical jurisdiction, but it also has a, a type of jurisdiction. The appeals court doesn't hear cases for the first time. They review the decisions of other courts. So let's say I went into the Capitol building yesterday in Washington, D.C., and I got arrested, and I got put on trial, and I lose that case, and I appeal it because I, I didn't, I didn't, my rights were violated during the trial process or whatever, I, and I appeal it, it would go to the appeals court, the appellate court, the circuit court, and if I lose that, and I still am not happy, I can always ask for one more chance, and that's at the Supreme Court. And since there's only one Supreme Court, it, this covers everything within the entire United States. And it's also mainly an appellate court. So you don't go straight to the Supreme Court, as one of the videos that you might have watched to start the week talks about. Um, you don't go there straight away. You get there by following, by working your way through. Same way you don't get to the championship game without the playoffs, without the regular season. Now, sometimes in very rare cases, the Supreme Court will take on something as an original jurisdiction, which means no other court has looked at it yet. But it's very, very rare. I'll give you an example in, in a couple minutes when we talk about that once more. So jurisdiction, jurisdiction is a term that means where do you have the power or authority? That would be another good synonym. What's their authority? Where do they have authority to apply the law? So um, let's take a look at that map because the next question says, where do you live? Which is your jurisdiction? We need to know where, which district we're in and which circuit we're in and which Supreme Court region we're in. So let me show you this map and uh, we'll take a look at it. Now, the colors and numbers 
are the circuit courts, the appeals courts. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So that's why as some of you said there were eleven circuit courts, but there's two more, and they didn't put the numbers on this map. Um, but they're right here. One is the DC circuit, because you know the District of Columbia is not a state, um, but it has its own circuit court. And then there's another one that's a federal circuit that deals with specialized types of cases. So there's 11 circuit courts, 12 and 13. So there's the 13 of them. And if we counted up all the states, 50, plus all the ones that have more than one, see all the dotted lines? Um, we would, if we counted all that up, we'd end up with 94. Now, you'll notice that some states like Wyoming and Utah and Nevada and Oregon only have one district court. They're not numbered. They're known by the name of their state. So um, the, if you're in Oregon and you face a federal crime, you would go to the Oregon district court. But some states, mainly those with larger populations, have more than one district court. So if you see here this dotted line running right down the middle of uh, Washington state, that divides the Washington district court into an eastern and a western district court. And if you can tell where we are, you're more impressive than I am because that dotted line goes like right through the middle of white salmon, according to this map. So let me tell you that we, you, all of us live in the Eastern District Court of Washington State. And if you look down here at California, the state with the most people, it has one, two, three, four different district courts. So going from this map, what district do we live in? We live in the Eastern Washington District. That means if you uh, have to appear in a district court, maybe you get a jury summons and you're going to be on a jury. Maybe you're getting sued or you're suing someone. Maybe you're a defendant or a witness in a criminal trial. You would go to the east. You'd probably go to the Tri-Cities. You might go um, to Spokane. Um, and I think the other one is in Ellensburg. There's three. There's three different locations within Eastern Washington. Um, what about the Appeals Circuit Court? Well, th that was the blue ones, right? The blue one, and we are in the ninth. And look how big that is. That's huge. It's all of Montana, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii. Oh, and let's just throw in all of Alaska, the biggest state of all. That's a huge territorially speaking, uh, circuit, or I'm sorry, uh, appeals court, circuit court. Yeah, it's a huge one. We are in the ninth circuit court, the ninth circuit. And as far as Supreme Court goes, well, there's only one. So that's us. We're in the United States Supreme Court. So again, um, there's three different levels. They have three different names. Um, we are in the Eastern Washington District Court, the Ninth Circuit Court, and the United States Supreme Court. Now, suddenly, our boxes are facing a different direction. And this one's how many judges actually hear a case. So if someone's, uh, if there's a trial going on in the district court, how many judges are sitting there with the gavel and the black robe watching the proceedings and making sure they work? Well, most times in the district level, it's one. So if you watch, um, if you watch Law and Order, or you watch any sort of, uh, you know, movie with a trial in it, and there's one judge up front, um, that's that's how we mostly think of of um, of cases. That's that's the district level model. Now, when you get to the appeals court, oh. In very rare instances, there'll be more than one. That, so it's very, very rare. I, don't need, I should probably take that off. It almost never happens. Um, the appeals or circuit court 
you now have three judges, but there's no jury. And, and in fact, the appeals court doesn't hear a brand new case. They don't hear all the evidence. They just look at what was the problem with the first trial. So if the defendant tried to present information to show that he was uh, innocent and the judge said, no, you can't use that, and the judge made a mistake, then the appeals court might say, nope, they made a mistake. That conviction doesn't, doesn't count. Um, and so the appeals or circuit court has three judges, but no jury. And they don't hear direct evidence. They just review the case itself. Now, sometimes uh, there's more than three. Sometimes there's six. Uh, 29 is almost impossible because they're in all different cities. Um, but if for a big, big, big issue, they might have six or nine. They might have more than three uh, judges involved. And then when it gets to the Supreme Court, all nine of them hear the case. So the number of courts and the number of judges go get smaller as you work your way through, but the number of judges who actually hear a particular case gets larger. That's why you only hear about 80 cases in all, because you have nine justices who have to hear all 80 of them. And if you have 30,000 uh, or 40,000 at the appeals court, you only have three judges in each. So you can divide up all your judges and that cuts down the numbers. Same with the district court. Now, what kinds of cases they typically hear? We already talked about this. Uh, district court usually hears federal, criminal, and civil trials for the first time because they're original jurisdiction. And the appeals court uh, only hears cases that are already decided at a lower level. So again, going back to the uh, people who broke into the Capitol building yesterday, if they hear, if they go on trial and they would start at the district level and if they wanted to appeal, whatever happened at that, they would be heard at the appeals level. And then the same with the Supreme Court would hear them after they've been heard at the cir circuit or appeals level. So again, sort of like the idea of a, of a season, a sporting season, you've got the regular season, you've got the playoffs in the middle and you've got the final game at the end and you can't get to the end unless you've done the middle. You can't get to the middle unless you've done the start, the first part. So it prog progresses through. Now, when were they created? This is kind of interesting. Um, the constitution, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, uh, the constitution only names one court and it's the Supreme Court. So that's the oldest one. Uh, the district court is almost as old though. The district court was created in the Judiciary Act of 1789. Um, and so one of the first things that Congress did soon after the constitution was written is they had to sort of flesh out what the federal courts were gonna look like. Um, and so that happens, the district courts happen almost as early as the Supreme Court, which we'll see in a second. In the middle is sort of the youngest, the youngest version of them, the appeals and circuit court was much, much later, 100 years, 102 years after they created the district courts, they created this middle level. Now, until 1891, if you had a case at the district level and you needed to appeal it, you had to go straight to the Supreme Court. And that would never work today to go from 300,000 cases to 80 you just couldn't do it. And that was what was happening in the 1800s. And so Congress said, you know, we need a kind of a middle ground where they can take care of a lot of these cases that really don't need to go to the Supreme Court. They need to get taken care of in the middle. And then some of them can still go to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was mentioned in the Constitution. Um, and so that's from 1787. So the Supreme Court's just a little bit older than all the district courts. Um, <coughs> and so for much of our history, we only had the two levels. Now we have a third. And some people actually say, given that, uh, you know, the cases numbers have grown so much that maybe there should be a fourth. Maybe there should be a, another level between this one and the Supreme Court, in which case it would be go right here and it'd be much, much younger. Um, 
there hasn't been any serious movement that way, but it's, it's a concern some people say we should probably look at. Um, <clears throat> when are decisions not final? Because usually I think you go to court and you get a decision, that's it, end of the story. But there are times when they're not final. In a district court, uh, a decision in the district court is not final when it's overturned by an appeals court or the Supreme Court, which is an appeals court. So um, the thing that would change a district court outcome would be the appeals or circuit court. And if they change things, that would stand unless it's overturned by the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, well, it's a Supreme Court. So you'd think it would be final, but it's not quite. A later decision by the Supreme Court can change an earlier decision. And, and the example in uh, the first assignment for the week is Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, when the Supreme Court decided that separate but equal was not constitutional in schools, they were really overturning an earlier uh, court case called Plessy versus Ferguson from 1897. So it's been around for 60 years. Uh, that said it was okay to have um, train cars is what this was about, but it was okay to have things separate between races as long as they were equal. And the Supreme Court looked at the educational system in 1954 and said, well, uh, first off, white schools and black schools are not equal. And one reason they're not equal is because they are separate. And so separate but equal is unconstitutional. Now, it doesn't happen very often that the Supreme Court changes um, their their decision, but it does happen. And it usually happens after a number of years, but sometimes it can happen pretty quickly. Um, and so when the Supreme Court changes a decision with overturning a case, it actually goes back to, you know, the Supreme Court can overturn the Supreme Court. Um, how long do judges serve on them? Uh, this one's pretty easy because the answer is the same for all. Life or it's actually called good behavior. So they can get impeached. Um, but generally speaking, if you get appointed to be a district court judge or an appeals court judge or a Supreme Court justice, you gotta stay as long as you want. And that question, I guess that issue is one I'm asking you to think about all week long because our last assignment for the week, the one that's due on Monday, um, the, the summative assignment, I think 4.4, is asking you to think about that. Is that a good thing? Should, should judges serve for life or should there be something else um, that determines when they might leave the courts? Um, and so whether you're a district court judge, an appeals court judge, or a Supreme Court justice, if you get that job, it's yours to keep as long as you want it. Um, now, are they expressed or implied courts? This is um, I think important to know, although we haven't talked a lot about expressed and implied powers this time through this course, but I think understanding is pretty important. The district courts are implied because they're not named in the Constitution. The same with the appeals court, but the Supreme Court is named in the Constitution. So we could get rid of the district courts and we could get rid of the appeals court, but we could not get rid of the Supreme Court without an amendment to the Constitution because that's what it actually says. It's in Article Two, Article Three, Section One, which we're going to be looking at tomorrow. Now that's it, just in time because we only have a minute left. Um, I would like you to type a question that you might have based on all of that in the chat to wrap things up. If you absolutely understand it, um, you have absolutely no questions. You can tell me that too. Just 